Hello and welcome to News Click. I'm Paranjay Guha Thakurtha. And today we are going to discuss Afghanistan. With me here from Kathmandu in Nepal, I have Anohita Mojumdar. She's a senior journalist who follows what is happening in Afghanistan. She's lived in Kabul and traveled across Afghanistan. She's, she's lived there for around eight years, around eight years, from the end of 2003 to early 2012. Uh, she's a former editor of Himal South Asia, the magazine and the portal. And, and she's following what's going on in Afghanistan. Aruhita, what we are today witnessing, and I'm going by reports in different media, is scenes of chaos at Kabul airport on Monday. On Sunday, India's Independence Day, the Taliban occupied Kabul, entered the capital of Afghanistan virtually unopposed. The president or the de of the former president, I should say perhaps, Ashraf Ghani, he left Afghanistan on Sunday, ostensibly because he said he wanted to avoid bloodshed. Now we've got amazing scenes happening. I mean, there are thousands of people on the runway on the tarmac of Kabul. We, we hear there have been over a hundred Indians, including personnel of the ITBP, the Indo-Tibetan Border Police, who are in Afghanistan. And, and the scenes are absolutely horrifying and crazy. But what we have, uh, as I'm talking to you a short while ago, a statement that has come from the spokesperson of the Russian embassy. And it says that Ashraf Ghani left Kabul in a helicopter and four cars. I don't know how he could have been in cars and in a helicopter, but apparently every, he had he was carrying huge amounts of cash. He was carrying so much cash that you had to leave some behind on the tarmac as it wouldn't all fit in. So this is a new development that we've seen happening on Monday evening as we record this program. As a senior journalist who watched very carefully from very close quarters what's happening in Afghanistan, could you, for the benefit of our viewers, quickly recap what has happened in recent times, in recent weeks, and to what extent was what we are seeing today expected? I think, Paranjoy, the speed with which uh, the provinces have fallen to the Taliban and now the capital, Kabul, that has taken everybody by surprise. But that being said, uh, I think uh, what is surprising is the short period of time in which they have been able to take over in the country. The fact that they have been able to take over is not a surprise to those who have been observing what has been happening in Afghanistan, not just in recent weeks and months, but actually over a period of years. In uh, many parts of the country, the Taliban were in control and the government had only nominal control in a large part of the country. In many areas, there was also uh, there were agreements which were broke, uh, brokered by the local uh, tribal leaders, uh, basically persuading both the Taliban and the government to keep their forces at bay and not engage in fights. So there was a kind of holding pattern in many areas. Uh, so I think the fact that they have now taken over after the American troops have led and the American troops have also, despite what they may claim, have not done a proper handover, as you perhaps know. Uh, they left very stealthily from Bagram, the uh, base outside Kabul, uh, which even shocked, I think, Afghans that they would leave in the middle of the night and leave the Bagram air base um, virtually unattended. Uh, so I think the speed with which they have left without a proper handover has also enabled this. On the political front, I think the fact that the U.S. went ahead and made a deal with the Taliban uh, and that the Afghan government was not a part of the, the talks or the deal, that had considerably weakened uh, the Afghan government's authority and had uh, strengthened the Taliban. I think in a place like Afghanistan, apart from uh, the, we see now the discussion about the Afghan army, the strength of the Afghan army and uh, its equipment, but I think morale has a big part to play. And I think uh, the US deal unfortunately strengthened the morale of the Taliban and weakened that of the government. 
there are other factors uh, which we can go into further in this. Uh, no, I, I, I want you to elaborate on one point you made. You are suggesting that there was some sort of a understanding, covert or otherwise, between the Americans and the Taliban. Now, this is contrary to what a lot of people believe. At the same time, there's also a lot of criticism of the Joe Biden administration for literally as suddenly going away. And, and after American forces and uh, the forces of its allies in the NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, were entrenched there for 20 years. Suddenly, as you said a little while ago, the sheer speed, the sheer rapidity with which the Taliban has evidently acquired control of that entire landlocked mountainous country has uh, really uh, uh, surprised quite a few people. So uh, uh, the deal I'm talking about actually, uh, Paranjoy, is the one which is very public, uh, where there was an agreement uh, on the part of the American forces to withdraw their troops in exchange for guarantees by the Taliban that the territory of Afghanistan will not be used by them to launch any attacks on the US or its allies. Uh, there were several other conditions in, uh, relating to violence uh, by the Taliban, etc. But these were virtually ignored in terms of the implementation of the deal. The US government did not enforce anything on the Taliban and the limited purpose seems to have been to have some kind of a face savings gesture which allowed them to leave the country. Uh, when you talk about 20 years of the uh, American and NATO presence, I think that has also been a, a very uh, uh, different phases of it. Uh, right at the beginning in 2001, uh, when there was a suggestion that uh, the NATO allies uh, should be brought in, the Americans were very insistent that the footprint should remain confined to just American forces. At that point, if you remember, they were trying to hunt for bin Laden and the Taliban and in the words of the then American president, George W. Bush, smoked them out of the caves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they didn't really want anybody getting in the way. Subsequently, uh, NATO allies were brought in and the ex uh, footprint of the forces was expanded. But it has very much been an American-led project uh, which has been dictated by America's very narrow uh, political agenda at all times. And uh, in the last phase, uh, which uh, actually perhaps started uh, even while I was there, though that's quite some time ago, there was this attempt to build up an Afghan army. Now, in, in Afghanistan, what has happened all along uh, on various fronts, but in this particular case, I'm talking about the Afghan army, there was a date and there was a number which was conjured up. Uh, I'm not sure on the basis of what. And, and so-called Afghan army was uh, set up uh, without adequate training, without uh, adequate command and control structures. You cannot build an army for a nation overnight at that scale and not have some problems. And I think those problems were pointed out at that time. But uh, I think with Afghanistan, uh, the last 20 years have been more about ticking boxes on time rather than actually looking at the reality on the ground. Tell me, Anohita, do you see a com continuity in American policy towards Afghanistan? George Bush Sr., George Bush Jr., Trump, Obama before Trump, Obama, and now Biden. I mean, is it that there is not even, I mean, you, you don't make out even a, a much of a nuance uh, in the way in which successive American administrations over the last two decades have looked on Afghanistan. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. I think there are different phases in the domestic policy of <coughs> the U US and so far as it has impacted on Afghanistan. So I would say that uh, the Bush administrations perhaps had more of a desire to get into Afghanistan and change things, whereas uh, Obama himself wanted to uh, curtail the number of troops. Uh, and he did, didn't really uh, you know, do it to the extent that he had thought he would. And Biden has followed in Obama's vein by uh, reining in the uh, number of troops and bringing it now down to zero. 
uh, now of course he is following um, you know uh, policies which were put in place uh, by his predecessor uh, president donald trump but uh, biden has also be uh, you know he has picked and chosen which of the policies of trump he wants to follow through on which and which ones he wants to disband in this particular case i think uh, there is no appetite for continuing in afghanistan within the domestic sphere of us politics and he probably felt that uh, he would lose a lot of goodwill which he had when he came into power if he allowed this to continue because at the time that he took uh, office things were in quite a bad shape in afghanistan and there was no easy way out uh, would he have taken this step if he had known uh that it would result in the kind of scenes that you have just described would he have taken that step with the alacrity if he had known exactly this uh i don't know uh the fact that the scenes you. would 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 come into place at some point was known but perhaps he thought that there would be enough of a gap so for the us administration to wash its hands off and blame it on the afghans no, but right minute. now clearly the biden administration is being criticized from different quarters for having not been unable to anticipate what would happen okay there is a certain continuity and there's also certain changes and yes uh, the domestic politics of the us also dictates uh, the uh, the american government or, or the administrations uh, the, the way it looks on uh, afghanistan but the question that is being asking by leaving a fairly substantial section of the afghan population which was opposed to the taliban virtually in the lurch and not being able to anticipate what would happen is seen as to be a major failure of the biden administration would you agree not entirely paranjoy um, like i said i think this could be foreseen and uh, anybody who's following afghanistan including uh, american advisors american policy experts uh, they have anticipated this the only thing not anticipated was how quickly it would happen and i'm sure the biden administration thought that there would be a respectable amount of time say 6 months or so uh, which uh, it would take for the uh, government in kabul to fall at which point they could much uh, uh, more easily blame it on afghan in fighting you know the, the shortcomings of the afghan government whereas right now it has come straight on the heels of the departure of the american forces and therefore it's more obviously and blatantly being linked to them okay uh, the same criticism is now being leveled at new delhi yes the process of evacuating indians and persons of indian origin from different parts of afghanistan had become had had started some time back well some time back but the very fact that you even today according to news reports have 200 odd indians stationed in afghanistan including i was told about 100 odd personnel of the indo tibetan border police now the the criticism is that the government of india should also have anticipated what would happen and evacuated these individuals and and these people earlier than it did would you go along with uh, that criticism i think the last uh, few weeks have been unprecedented and i really don't think anybody anybody was predicting that kabul would fall quite so quick, uh, quickly so to, you know to give the indian government uh, the benefit of doubt but i do think that in the last few days as provinces were falling really quickly and the approach uh, to kabul after ghazni felt it became clear that uh, it would fall very quickly so i don't know the logistics of whether okay. they could have moved out people in the last few days uh, before uh, kabul fell uh, but um, i i would say that the rapidity has taken everybody by surprise All right. okay anuvita what does what what does recent developments tell you about india's policy towards afghanistan the narendra modi government over the last 7 years uh, its policies towards afghanistan how, how would you evaluate these 
not just this government, but overall India's strategy towards Afghanistan is also determined by its strategy towards Pakistan. Mm. Uh, there is perhaps not such a great reason for uh, India's intense uh, engagement, the amount of aid it provides, the number of consulates it has, and the number of projects. Of course, the official line is that this is you know country to country, uh, goodwill, but India does not exhibit that kind of goodwill towards any other country. Uh, so I think one must accept the fact that it is guided by the fact that of its, uh, Afghanistan's proximity to Pakistan. Uh, and this narrow approach, I think, has not really helped. Um, in, uh, uh, India has failed to, the Indian government, I should say, in the, the Indian government has failed to really broaden its contacts uh, with the people and has also failed to broaden its contacts within the Afghan leadership, uh, casting it very narrowly in terms of who might serve it better vis-a-vis -vis its um, policy towards Pakistan. And for that reason, also for the longest time, I think India had relied on the US uh, to use its leverage vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan within uh, Afghan policy, rather than really embarking on its own. And I think uh, the fact that as a regional country, I think India could have played a role in bringing a different kind of understanding, you know, whether it's about politics or development or other issues to Afghanistan. But I think the entire uh, project, Afghan project of the last 20 years has been led by the U.S. And uh, that that is, that is uh, what we are seeing today is largely the result of that. Okay. Uh Anuhita, what impact do you think recent developments in Afghanistan will have on Pakistan and, and Imran Khan and, and the, the, the Imran Khan regime? I uh, don't really know uh, what the impact will be because um, as of now, it's very hard to say what this version of Taliban will look like. Um, I, as we know, the Taliban have in the past found very active support from the uh, government of Pakistan. Over a period of time, the support has wavered, has waned, has been uh, provided by perhaps uh, government uh, groups which are not directly uh, from the government, but uh, supported by the government. Uh, Pakistan has its own problem with uh, Taliban within Pakistan. Um, and we really don't know what form or shape of governance the Taliban will uh, undertake within uh, Afghanistan now in their kind of uh, second rendition. So much will depend on that. Uh, the Taliban's focus in the past has largely been uh, within the country. Uh, they have not been an exporter of terror like, for example, the Al-Qaeda. Uh, what happened in the last few years of uh, the Taliban when they were earlier in power was very much at the behest of Al-Qaeda. For example, the blowing up of the Bamiyan Buddhas, that happened in 2001. Whereas uh, March that, uh, 2001. I'm, I'm going to come to that in a short while from now. But I wanted to ask you the impact on Kashmir, the militancy in the Kashmir Valley. Do you expect, as some do, that what has happened in Afghanistan would result in an escalation of tensions in the Kashmir Valley? Um, I don't know, Paranja. I, I, I have uh, covered Kashmir in the past, but uh, I don't follow uh, this issue very closely okay. now. So I, I wouldn't like to uh, speculate okay. on that. Uh, when I was covering Kashmir, there were all these stories of Afghan fighters coming in. But um, uh, I don't know how much of that was um, actual fact. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, there are uh, the Pashtun people on either side of the Duran line have similarities of culture, of language. Uh, so uh, one doesn't know whether all of them were actually Afghans who were being sent there or not. And also at that point, like I said, the Al-Qaeda had a big influence okay. uh, within Afghanistan. Um, so it really depends on how the new... Uh, uh, governance of this uh, Taliban uh, shapes up. All right. Let me ask you, uh, let, let me go back in time. Uh, Afghanistan, in more ways than one, is a unique 
part of the world. We know it's landlocked. We know it's largely mountainous. We know it's, uh, you know, it, it's like the intersection of Central Asia and, and South Asia. It's bordered on the east and the south by Pakistan, Iran on the west, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan on the north, China in the northwest. And if you look back in time, it is often said that Afghanistan is unconquerable. And in fact, it is supposed to be the graveyard of empires. People talk about, you know, how Afghanistan was a buffer in the great game, quote unquote, great game between British India and the Russian empire. But, but, but you know, from the days of Alexander the Great to the Mauryas, to the Mughals, to the Muslim Arabs, to the Mongols, to the British, to the Soviets, to the Americans, all of them have failed to, quote unquote, conquer Afghanistan. Your views? Well, I really hope uh, that nobody can and ever will conquer Afghanistan because I think that's a, a historical term which should have been outdated long ago. But phrases like graveyard of empires, etc., yeah, it's sometimes also very lazy cliches that we journalists like to use because it's difficult to explain co uh, complex concepts. Uh, but I think certainly um, they are a very independent minded people. And uh, I think the attempts to impose uh, different kinds of projects and different kinds of, uh, you know, uh, different kinds of uh, values um, have, have uh, met their comeuppance in Afghanistan. But I would say this is, uh, this also happens within Afghanistan. There are uh, multiple cultures uh, and I think the attempts to impose the culture of one part of the country on another has also met with resistance. So the reason why I think the uh, international intervention in 2001 was welcomed by a large part of the Afghan population was because they did not like the kind of culture which was being imposed on them. Uh, and they were used to greater freedoms, individual freedoms, and uh, they, they did not like this kind of an imposition. So I think, uh, yes, they are definitely uh, very independent in wanting to determine their own path. Okay. We all know that Afghanistan has very high levels of impoverishment. Education, healthcare, facilities are inadequate. Child mal malnutrition is prevalent. Corruption, a lot of the acquisition of arms has been, ha, has been uh, on account of the, the opium trade. Uh, and and, and uh, Afghanistan happens to be very much a part of that golden, so-called golden triangle. So we see here a country which is also, as you mentioned earlier, not a homogeneous country. There are many ethnic groups, many things, and often they've been at war, there's been civil strife, civil war. But juxtapose that with the socio-economic conditions that have been prevailing in Afghanistan uh, for a fairly long period of time, um, for, for several decades, if not even more than that. Uh, how do you reflect on, on these aspects of Afghanistan? I think uh, Afghanistan has been in conflict now. We're uh, entering the fifth decade of conflict. Uh, you know, Afga the Americans keep talking about the forever war and uh, how they could not, you know, the conflict has, uh, they've been there for two decades, but Afghans are in the fifth decade of uh, conflict. And that has, that has had, had a real toll on the people and uh, Unfortunately, I think uh, efforts to revive the economy have been very uh, ad hoc and they have not taken the uh, health of the economy into account. So again, we, it's have, we have a very project-led approach towards the Afghan economy and you probably- India builds that. a dam, India builds roads, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think every country has had its own set of priorities. And I think a lot of the development aid provided by a lot of the Western countries, for example, 
followed the uh, their military troop movement you know so they they were spending money where their troops were uh, rather than looking at the health of the entire country and uh, afghanistan is a primarily an agrarian country so efforts should have been made to uh, you know to bring that uh, back to where it could provide subsistence okay. living rather than perhaps some fancier economic uh, projects okay uh, anuvita there is it's not just afghanistan as a country but the taliban has been negatively stereotyped i could argue in the international media including in india and and these have i mean these kind of stereotypes get reinforced you mentioned earlier in our conversation about the the bamian buddhas the you know the the amazing 6th century carvings in in the middle of of a, i mean on a, on a mountain side that was carved in which was blown up in march 2001 now that's one part the other is the treatment of women and we we i mean in the international media there's a surfeit of horror stories which would seek to tell you how terrible how regressive how 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 fundamentalist the taliban are your opinion i think the women of afghanistan have been used again and again as a tool uh, for uh, to pursue various political projects um so again if we are looking at afghanistan i think uh, the culture uh, of uh, women uh, throughout the country is extremely di uh, different kabul was a city which was much more cosmopolitan than our capitals uh, you know uh, a century ago uh, but in parts of uh, the deep south in afghanistan the culture is much more conservative and they would observe a uh, parda uh, which in their case would be the burqa uh, for um, you know any time they stepped out of the house and uh, some some women in some parts women don't go out without uh, an escort but this is also part of the local culture uh, what the taliban uh, did was try to impose their version of having women uh, not having women in the public uh, space without escort and uh, you know without the proper what they would consider the proper attire throughout the country which are, like i said was not acceptable to large uh, parts of the country but uh, i think uh, in order to uh, pursue a political project they have not really looked at the taliban and i would argue that even if uh, from a strategic point of view somebody is viewing the taliban as an enemy i think it's important to be realistic about actually uh, you know what the enemy is like and i think the rush to demonization has conflated women's rights with this picture of the taliban which is it's much more nuanced so i'll give you two examples which might be surprising to most people um uh, the pashtun wali code which is the code of Uh, the law governing uh, pashtun tribes uh, talks about bad and badal where you exchange women from uh, two families or you give women in exchange for a certain transaction or a certain crime now the taliban had actually put an end to both these practices because they said that this was against the sharia uh, similarly they they have in the last few years in many areas where they have had control they have put uh, an end to this exorbitant uh, bride prices uh, that are prevalent in um, afghanistan so i think a more nuanced appreciation of their uh, character and much of it is extremely regressive uh, because they are imposing the culture uh, as a state party on areas of afghanistan where the culture is very different it needs to be considered but it's uh more nuanced than most people understand it to be okay uh we are almost at the end of our conversation on ohita i have two last questions for you i look back again and then i'll ask you to look ahead look back i mean look there's a long history i'm not an expert on the subject 1919 the third anglo afghan war monarchy king amanullah then then zahid shah for about half a century you had the monarchy 
And then we see gradually changes happening. Late 70s, the Soviets come in, 1978. 80s, the fight with the Mujahideen. Then we see by the, by the mid 90s, most of, much of Afghanistan has been captured by, by the Mujahideen. We know what happened to Najibullah and the terrible way he, he died. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, people are today contrasting uh, of, uh, Ashraf Ghani's fleeing the, uh, his country with what happened to uh, Najibullah. But the, and then of course, the US invasion comes in 2001. When you look back, how do you then contextualize what is happening today in the history, in the history, uh, uh, given the history, the very troubled uh, history and the checkered history of Afghanistan? And from here, I'd ask you to reflect what is likely to happen in the near future. I think, uh, unfortunately, Afghanistan has also not been allowed to pursue its own destiny by uh, various countries, uh, you know, and Afghans are always blamed for the violence within their country, but they have never really been left alone. You you talked about how Afghanistan was a buffer, you know, between the uh, Tsarist uh, Russia and uh, the British Empire. Um, and uh, I think uh, all along it's been uh, seen as a staging post for various ambitions in the region and outside the region as well. So if, if Afghans were given a chance, we would, uh, you know, things might be very different. Looking ahead, it's uh, very, very difficult at this point of time to predict anything. But I have been, uh, I have friends who are in Afghanistan and friends uh, who are also not, not all are trying to leave the country. You know, they feel like it's uh, their country and they are there to stay and, and work for the country. So I think, um, you know, the hope must rest with people that uh, uh, the Afghan people get the kind of governance and uh, political leadership um, that they deserve. Thank you so much, Anohita, for Thank sharing you. your thoughts, your views on what is happening in Afghanistan. And as you rightly pointed out, it's extremely difficult to predict where what will happen in the near future. And we all hope that the people of Afghanistan will have a greater say in shaping their destiny. Thank you once again for being with us and all of you who've been watching this program, do keep watching Newskick.